Good morning. Good morning. You ever get tired of sitting? Yeah. You know, I preached for some years in bush camps. You never got a chance to sit, you know. And you never knew where you were going to preach, and you never had a pulpit. It was really different. And I remember one case, just one big room, not as, well, maybe as big as this room. And over the fire corners of here, and then there was a wire strung from the ceiling, and guys, clothes hanging on, on the wire, you know. And then uh, they had a shelf right across the sand. That's where they all slept. That's where I slept, too, on the shelf. They just moved over a little bit, let me get in, you know. Anyway, I stood over here preaching, and uh, guys are sitting there, hats, cigarettes, cigars sometimes. It's their turf. I couldn't tell them what to do. And you know, I'd got to pull out a bottle of whiskey and take a shot halfway through the sermon, you know. You just ignored all that stuff. And, and when I'm preaching, it was really different. But it was a great time at the same time. I got into a camp one time. Actually, this was the first time I ever preached in bush camp. I'd worked in bush camps before, so I knew what the life was like. And I was a little bit nervous about going into this bunkhouse and inviting these guys to the meeting that night. I got in the bunkhouse. There was three radios going. There was two or three poker games going. Some guy drinking home brew, you know, and I couldn't get anybody's attention. I felt like a fool of hollering in. Nobody listened. Then the guy came on, what's up, Doc? He said, oh, I said, I have an announcement. Oh, see, tall around, got all the ladies off, got her, and everybody came in crowd. What's, what's the news, you know? Well, I was dressed like a bush worker, you see, and that's why I said I'm a preacher, and they roared with laughter. It was just a big joke, you see. I finally persuaded them, and then they began to a little cheering and catcalling and whatnot, and good-naturedly. And uh, then one said, well, we're all beer drinkers, and if you have some beer at the meeting over in the cookhouse, we'll sure come. What do you say, guys? Yeah, yeah, it all comes with beer. I said, you guys know what the Bible says about beer? Total silence, you know. What does it say? Well, it says that when the children of Israel came to a place called beer, the Lord gave them water to the man. And I said, you know, it's a bottle of water in the kitchen, you guys can help yourself. You know, I had to check that out after to see if I, it just came to my mind, you know. It's an exodus, it actually says that, you know. And the Lord just bailed me out, you know. So they all came to the meeting that night, you know. So. That's how the Lord got me going, and uh, we sure had some experience sometimes. I remember one time had a full house, and all the guys were there, and one of the guys was drunk, and he got up and started telling us a life story. Well, I knew I had to get rid of him in a hurry, I'd lose all the guys, you know. So I went down, took him by the elbow, and let him out, and boy, was he mad. He said, you keep in the bubbles rush in front of the gang. I said, well, you deserve it, man, you know. I said, you wouldn't do this in church back then. I sure would. Well, he was dumb, you know, drunk enough to say almost anything. And I knew I had to get rid of him, and he was, he was arguing with me, and all of a sudden the guy started singing, back in the meeting, you know. <laughs> They're singing. Uh, I had a little song sheets I'd given out to them, and uh, they were singing away, you know. It turned out that the cook of the camp, a male, was a born again believer. And he knew I was in trouble, so he took the meeting over. <laughs> he was leaving the song. <laughs> So the Lord bailed me out there too, you know. Another time I got to a Jehovah Witness camp, and I knew I was going to have trouble there. I found that there was eight guys who weren't Jehovah Witnesses, and they stayed in a little shack by themselves, and the rest were all JWs, their wives and their kids and everything, you know. So I got to the powers of be, and they said, well, no, there's no place to hold me. I said, what's wrong with the cookhouse? Well, they're watching the fortnight. Well, I said, you've got two cookhouses. What about the second cookhouse? No, no, they're painting the floor there. Oh. I said, what about the bunkhouse? I asked the guys, and the guys say, okay, it's okay. So the bunkhouse. Yeah, you can come and preach all you want, but you've got to give us a chance to ask questions afterwards. Good deal, that's right, I'll do that. What they didn't know was the night before I'd been in a Mennonite camp, and they had a beautiful quartet there, a male quartet. And I'd invite them to come to this JW camp the next night, just in case I had a meeting and sing, you see. And I told him, I said, now if you guys come and I have a meeting, come about 8 o'clock and I'll listen for you coming up, we'll get together. If you don't come, it's okay. Anyway, I told the quartet, I said, listen, they don't believe in being saved, so sing that song, Be Saved Tonight, you know. And they don't believe in the reality of heaven, so sing, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be, you know. And these guys, when they walked in, the whole psychologically had a tremendous impact on the meeting, you know. These guys looking, wondering what's going on. These four big guys, you know, 
and how they sang with all the accompaniments, you know. And then I preached. And there was a guy in a bunk right here. I could have tapped him on the head. He was just on his hands and listening carefully, you know. Anyway, I preached. And then asked for questions. Do you know how many I got? I never got one. They were just sitting with their heads down, you know. Nobody knew what to say, so we made the gospel course as clear as we could. And I said, you know, uh, Paul knew he was saved. He wrote to people and knew they were saved. And I know I'm saved. How come you guys don't? You know? And nobody said a word, you know. The next morning, just as I was leaving the camp, I stayed with the eight guys who were in JWs. And the next morning, as I was walking past the mill, it broke down. So the water pilots had nothing to do. They were standing around in a group talking. So I went over and talked to them. One of them said to me, Hey man, that was great last night. I said, Really? What did you learn? He said, I found it for the first time. You can know you're saved. And I got saved last night, he said. Praise the Lord, you know. The next year when I came back to the same camp, that different strategy for me. So they said we were going to have a certain building, so we went to the building, and um, they had three chairs set up, and one for me, I was in the center, there was a guy on each side firing questions at me, and the rest of the gang were standing all around, you know. I like that kind of situation. I like getting into a jam, you know, because by my God I've run through a troop, by my God I've leaped over a wall. I had a great time there that night. They start off by saying, Now you believe that Jesus Christ is equal to God? Yes, I do. We don't believe that because it says that Jesus was subject to his uh, earthly father, or to his Father in heaven, and uh, so he couldn't be subject to them if he was equal to, to God. You know, he couldn't be subject to them if he was equal to. Uh, and you know, I shot up a prayer, and the answer came down like a lightning. I said, Well, was Jesus Christ greater than Mary and Joseph? Oh yes, of course, yeah. Well, it says in the Gospel of Luke that he came down to Nazareth and was subject unto them. If he could be subject to his earthly parents, could not be subject to his heavenly Father? And it went like that for an hour and a half. And you know, it was really neat. There were a lot of questions. And finally we're all standing around and one guy says, Well, if there's anything for sure, we can't know your shape. Boy, that was just a, you know, springboard. And I just said, listen guys, if I was to say I wasn't saved, it would be the biggest lie in this world because I told them how Jesus Christ had saved me years before. You know, there wasn't sound, you know. Don't be afraid of Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't know their Bibles well. They have some proof texts they know well. You get them away from that? I was witnessing the door while I was in Transformer. This guy, uh, he came to the door, a great big guy, and he was a JW. We had quite a little lively discussion, you know. And so I said, uh, you know, it says in Isaiah, Jehovah said, I am the first and I am the last. Right? That's right. Could anybody else say that? Oh, no. He said, no, this is there. I said, how come Jesus said that in Revelation chapter 1? Long silence, you know. Well, he says, you know, the Bible gets flaky sometimes. <laughs> anyway, so much for that. Do you sometimes read something in the Bible you don't understand? How do you handle it? I learned how to handle it as a young Christian by reading something in Dwight L. Moody said. He said, I read the Bible the way I eat fish. If I come across a bone, I don't quit eating fish, I just lay the bone on the side of the plate and go on eating fish. He said, I do the same if I come across something I don't understand, I don't quit reading the Bible, I just lay it aside. And so I, I did the same, you know, and... Uh, something you don't understand, well, God knows what it means, so you ask God to help you understand it. And somewhere down the road, sooner or later, you get the answer. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 14. Now Paul is praying for something to happen to the Christians at Ephesus, okay? For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, 
that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. I got that far as a young Christian. I thought, what no one's he praying for? I mean, how come he's praying for these Christians of at Ephesus that the Holy Spirit or that Christ will they get Christ in their heart I read through about 16 times now that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith some translation that Christ may abide in your heart by faith I, could, I just couldn't get it what's he talking about aren't they all Christians they already have Christ living in their heart why is Paul praying this way it didn't make any sense you know so what was the ball in the face so I laid it inside of the plate and that's not take care of it. Not long after, there's a Greek scholar called Kenneth Weiss, W-E-S-T, and he did his own copy of the New Testament, and I happened to get a copy, and I'm reading it in Ephesians chapter 3, and here's what his verse said. That he would grant you, then verse 17, that Christ, here's what he, what he had, that Christ may settle down and feel at home in your heart. I say. Christ doesn't always feel at home in our hearts, you know. If there's things in our hearts that shouldn't be there, Christ really doesn't feel at home. That doesn't mean he leaves, but he is disquieted, and we lose our joy, we lose our peace. I mean, hundreds of times over the years, people say, well, I just don't have any peace, you know, I don't have any joy out of here. What's wrong, you know? The problem is never with God, it's, it's always with us. Our heart is supposed to be his home. Okay? We are his temple. He lives there. I remember being in a hotel one time in Grandview, Manitoba, many years ago. I was preaching in bush camps up in the Duck Mountain. And I stayed overnight in this hotel. I just happened to get a room over the beer parlor. And Saturday night, you can imagine, the hollering and the shouting and the bombing and I think a couple of fights went on and all kinds of stuff. Do you think I felt at home? So it was a strange hotel. I was sitting there and the door opened. The guy walked in, looked under the bed, looked in the closet and walked out again. Didn't say anything, you know. It was that kind of a place, you know. I mean, I put a chair under the door now. <laughs> but I did something that wasn't too charitable. I prayed that God would burn this hornet's nest down, you know. I, I made sure, I said, now make sure nobody gets hurt, you know. And you know what, I burned about a week later, you know. I didn't feel I had to let the insurance company know that I didn't do it, you know. So. Yeah. But I didn't feel at home, I'll tell you, there. And I've been in a different place over the years, especially in that kind of ministry where you just didn't feel at home, you know. And you couldn't do anything about it. And people, there are times when Christ doesn't feel at home in my heart, in your heart, you know. And if he doesn't feel at home, yes? I started out to say, that's exactly, like, on the way to Winnipeg, me and Frank and John were reading through the whole book of Ephesians, and we're done, that's the exact portion that uh, we reread again, Frank reread it, and we later testified, I met now you're preaching on it, I just have to tell you. Okay. <laughs> All right. We may have a heart that's full of envy. Are you envious of what other people have? Wish you had a better wife, a better husband, a better home, a better job, a better car, better kids. Are you envious? The Bible makes it very clear we're not to be envious of anybody. You know, you should be totally satisfied with your situation in life, whatever it is. You need more money? Well, that's fine. If God knows you need it, you'll get it in due course of time. But we're not to be envious at the wicked, especially at the wicked, it says. You know, they do things, bad things, and earn money, and get lots of money, and, and they zoom ahead, and, and you don't get anywhere, and you're living a righteous life, and you wonder how come this is, you know. But we're told very clearly in Psalm 37 that we're not to be envious at the workers of iniquity because they'll soon be cut down. And they'll wither away, you know. Okay? Or a heart 
gospel of Calvinism, which is much the same, Luke 12, 15. Christ said, take heed. You know, Christ had been talking about the unpardonable sin in the context, and there was a guy in the crowd who wasn't listening, and when he got a chance when Christ stopped for a minute, he said, Master, speak to my brother, we need to divide the inheritance of me. And Christ said, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And then he said, that's what he said to the guy, then he said to them, it says to the crowd, take heed and beware of covetousness, because a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Our houses are so full of things, their feet stick out the windows. We still don't have any more time for God. It's like that, isn't it? Covetousness. You remember in the Old Testament there were eight things that the Israelites were told they were never to covet? Your neighbor's wife, husband, ox, 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 ass, or servant, man, servant, maid, servant, or anything he had. You're not to cover anything your neighbor had. That's, that's a hard one. Sometimes we, we don't even realize what's going on, but we're coveting certain things that other people have, and we're envious at them, and Christ is disquieted within us because we're supposed to be satisfied in Him. It's like God said to Abraham, Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. If you've got God, you've got everything. You've got everything. I say it again, if you've got God. So don't ever be covetous. It grieves Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's unbelief. You ever go to a meeting and just say to yourself, oh, nothing's going to happen here, you know, it's going to be dead, you know. And it seems dead to you, maybe quite a lot of somebody else. I never could understand as a pastor, when you're, people are falling by shaking your hand at the Sunday morning service, and somebody says, you know, Pastor, oh, 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 I didn't get it anything this morning. I actually fell asleep. God just wasn't here. Somebody else comes around, grabs your hand, and they're, and they're weeping, and say, oh, Pastor, God spoke to my heart this morning. He blessed me so greatly. I mean, in the same meeting, you know. How do you figure it out? Well, you have to figure it out somehow. <laughs> anyway, Hebrews 3 12 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and depart from living God. But exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So be careful, brethren, if you don't have an evil heart of unbelief. I had a friend in the States and he. He had to travel, but he was on the flying all the time in his business. And uh, so one morning he told me he had a fight with his wife, and uh, he didn't make it up, and then just he took off, and that was that. So he made up his mind, I'm not going to witness to anybody today. He was the kind of a guy, and he was both his wife. They're always witnessing to people, but he made up his mind. No, he had a bad attitude. He was really upset and angry with his wife, and he's flying, you know. I'm sure not going to witness to anybody, you know. Well, he opened his briefcase, and the New Testament fell on the floor from his briefcase, and the girl sitting next to him says, Oh, is that a Bible? And she picks it up, you know. Well, yeah, it's a Bible, you know. Oh, do you, you read the Bible? You know? <laughs> and he said, That rascally Lord of mine, he made me with this. <laughs> and he led this girl to Christ, you know, see. But he had this evil heart of unbelief. We go that way. But, you know, did you want to pray before you came today? Not that I ask you to raise your hand or anything, but I ask this question quite often in churches, and I call it an embarrassing question because the response usually, almost always, is very slow, very low. Very few people come to church service praying first, you know, expecting a blessing and praying for God to bless. You know, about two years ago, my phone rang, long distance call from Phoenix, Arizona. The fellow gave me his name, and then he said, uh, I was in some of your meetings years ago, and I was really blessed by them, and he said, I found out where you lived, and uh, he said, I just want to pray for you. So he started to pray. And people, it went on for ten minutes, and he went most of the time. All the time I was just getting showered to death there. And he, and it wasn't put on, it was a, it's just a mighty thing, you know. He's known me several times since. He, he always wants to pray, you know. He doesn't want to talk much, but he wants to pray for me. And that's beautiful, you know. Uh, at one time when I was in Crusades, I had 18 people 
who prayed for me every day. Some of these people fasted and prayed one day a month or maybe one day a week even, you know. And they were part of my team. CUF never heard about them. They didn't know about them, but I knew about them. And they were the ones I was under God. I was looking to. Anyway, a heart full of worry and unbelief, taking brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. You sit there in a meeting with unbelief in your heart, nothing's going to happen. You just hope he's not a long sermon. This kind of garbage, you know. And the, and the Christ who lives within you will be grieved, you know. You lose your joy and peace, and sometimes it's hard to get it back unless we come on God's terms. But what about pride? They, I've often heard people, sometimes preachers, say the, the biggest problem they have is simply pride. You know, you preach a great sermon, and people tell you what a great sermon it was, and then you're on cloud nine for a while. And then maybe your wife will bring you down. <laughs> Something will may happen somewhere and he will come down. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You can be sure of that. God has angels who know how to put a cane between your legs and trip you up, you know. And so um, pride God hates because it's Satan's sin. His sin. He corrupted his wisdom. Does anybody know the rest of that? In Ezekiel. He corrupted his wisdom. By reason of his brightness, that is, he got looking at himself instead of looking to God. And he saw how much more beautiful than the average or angel he was. And he was a goner. Pride. I don't know, when I look at myself and know my own heart, there really isn't any room for pride, you know. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss, and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. If you've got a pride problem, take a trip to the cross. Ask God to speak to you about the cross. You know, one chapter in the Bible I read again and again and again and again is Isaiah 53. There's things in that chapter that you don't get at one reading. You may be even after six readings. All we like sheep have gone astray and we've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I think the Martha reading there in the KJ says, um, and the Lord has made the sin of us all to meet on him. Our sin, your sin, my sin. Time goes before destruction. Do you have a judgmental spirit? Many people try to justify having a judgment. Well, you have to pass judgment. Well, there may be some things with your own kids, you know, yes. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 it says, Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then, listen, then shall every man have praise of God. The weakest Christian, God will be able to praise in that coming day. Who are you that judges another man's servant to his own master who stands or falls? Yes, he shall be held up, for God is able to make him stand. It's not your business to be, you know, criticizing and judging some of the guys hired children. That's what the Bible say. I gave you in one of the other meetings the God recipe for revival in James chapter 4 and after going through that the next verse says uh, speak not evil one of another brethren. This has been called this is not judging. It's been called the favorite indoor sport of even jobs. It is. I was flying in Austria one time and got talking to the guy next to me. He was a born again believer. He said I was raised Orthodox Catholic. And then he said um, some Pentecostals got a hold of me and I could see it, you know. Oh, I said it was nice. And where did you go to church? Oh, he said I've gone back to the Orthodox Church. Oh, really? I said, why did you do that? He said, you know those Pentecostals? He said, this is not true of all Pentecostal by any means, but it was the one he happened to be in. It could have been a Baptist church. He said, in the church I went to, they were always constantly criticizing one another. 
I never ever heard that from the Greek Orthodox Church, you know, so I went back to the church, you know. You and I have no business. Now, if somebody is sending a Christian brother or sister, you have a right to go with them and talk to them about it. Not from up here, down there, but on the same level. You know, you have a right to do that. And sometimes it's a duty to do that, but not to gossip about them to somebody else. That's not your business. So it says, judge what? Judge nothing. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Judgment of spirit. Maybe a harmful of us. You know, pornography is a great problem even among evangelicals. I'm going to give you a couple of illustrations here. I had meetings in the Bureau of Alliance in Edmonton, and a pastor who was attending a meeting, not from that church, came for counseling one night and he told me, he said, I'm hooked in pornography. I think I've got demons or something. He said, it's just totally overwhelming, he said, and I'm going to have to leave the ministry because I just can't stop it. We checked him out. It wasn't a demon problem. I reminded him the Bible says that no man say, when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man. But every man's tempted when he's drawn away with his own lust and enticed. I said, brother, it's you. And you've got to repent. I had a song even with me, and we knelt to him, and he started to pray. Oh, that's uh, one of those cases where I think you forgot we were in the room. I mean, he was alone with God. And he was praying, his body was snapping back and forth. He was crying to God. And telling God how wicked, rotten, hell-deserving sinner he was. And he totally repented, you know. And he prayed on, and we just prayed silently. And suddenly, you know what happened? He laughed. And you could hear the chains hit the floor, you know. He was free, and he knew it. Oh, man, what a time of shelter we had afterwards. He said, I want to give my testimony to one. And Melissa said, listen, if you give your testimony, don't talk about the porno problem, problem, you know. Just say you had a great problem that Jesus delivered you from. Okay. So the next night, we had a guy taping all the meetings, and so I went to the guy, and I said, now, I'd like you to tape everything tonight, not just my sermon. He's just been doing my sermon. Now, tape everything. I said, okay, sure, no problem at all. So I'll do that. I mean, he's sitting right there, and I'm talking to him. So this guy gave his testimony, but he said, you know, God led me to sing a song, and he wasn't a singer. Oh, happy day that takes my choice, I'll be my Savior and my God. And people listen. As he began to sing, God came on the scene. If you shut your eyes, you'll have sworn that God had lowered an angel on a golden cord, and an angel was singing. The whole congregation was weeping. I was weeping. I mean, God was so near. It was incredible. The pastor of the Bureau of Alliance, the head pastor, he said afterwards, I'm 63 years old, I've been in the ministry a long while. I've never heard singing like that in my life. Well, I said, I've heard it before in revival meetings. I said, it's God the Holy Ghost. I thought to myself, I've got all this on tape. This is going to be great. Man, pray to other Christians, you know. So I went to see the guy, and he taped everything tonight. No, I said, I just taped your sermon. I said, what? <laughs> well, did you want more than that? I said, don't you remember for the service? You sat there, I stood here and asked you to tape everything tonight? How did I remember that? I said, I said, you don't remember it. <laughs> I thought, like I said, are you a goon or something? <laughs> I said, forget it. I walked away muttering to myself. I go, a stupid character, man alive. How stupid did they forget? <laughs> the Lord said, get on your knees. I mean, it's close to the So I never got on my knees. And the Lord said, now stay there until you can praise me that it wasn't taped. I didn't want it taped. I was just meant for this crowd to know. So it took me about five minutes to get over it. And I was able to praise the Lord for it. It's never been a problem since. So. Judgmental spirit, the poem. We had one other case in the Son of Boy, Saskatchewan. And the guy came up to me before a meeting and he said, uh, my wife and I were in a missionary meeting recently and we went forward and dedicated our lives to full-time missionary service, but uh, he laughed, we, we, can't, we can't go into any kind of ministry. I said, why not? He said, well, we're hooked on porno. He told me, he, he said, I started off, I got my wife into it and, 
we, we're now looking for dirtier stuff all the time, he said, and, and we're doing some of this stuff. And I said, uh, do you want to be out of it? No, as a matter of fact, I don't. He said, I enjoy it too much. And he started to walk away. And I stopped him. I said, now just a minute before you go, are you a born again believer? Well, he said, I've accepted Christ into my heart. I said, okay, then listen to this before you go. Every time you watch that rotten filth, you're forcing the Christ who lives within you to watch it with you. And you know what happened? I'm not exactly, he fell on his face on that carpet of throne, just wept and wept and wept. <laughs> he kept crying, God, I didn't realize. I didn't realize, God, can you forgive me? And he just wept his way back to God, you know. They went to Bible college after that, and we have ministry now, I don't know where, but this is how it was, you know. But that's what's happening. People don't think of that. You watch some salacious thing, you know? Well, I'm not going to do it often. I might do it once or twice, but Christ says to watch it with you. And that's what we're up against, you know. That's why he's praying that Christ would settle down and feel at home. As new believers, sometimes we do a lot of things we shouldn't do because we're not taught, you know. But sometimes after 15 years of Christian, we're still doing some of the things we have been taught, you know, that we shouldn't be doing. And then sometimes it's just an unforgiving spirit. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Is there anybody you can't forgive? People sometimes say, oh, if you knew what I've gone through, you know why I can't forgive. I feel like saying, oh, come on, drop that. What are you talking about? You think I haven't heard anything? I've been around a long while here, I see. No. I tell people, you can't tell me anything that would shock me. I've heard it all, you know. <laughs> so people, you know, have this attitude. It's crazy. Can't forgive. Why can't you forgive? Well, it was so rotten. You know. Okay? What did Christ pray on the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He forgave the world for crucifying on the cross. Now you see, when he asks us to forgive us, he does it on the basis, even as Christ has forgiven you. Sometimes I repeat myself, illustrations of every have to forgive me for that. Spurgeon did the same I discovered. <laughs> but I had a case, you know, where a fellow phoned me one night, about 2 o'clock in the morning. He just confessed to his wife he had committed adultery on one occasion and she wouldn't forgive him and she ordered him out of the house. And so I went over there in the middle of the night. And so she's mad as a hatter, you know. And he's sitting there crying. And I finally got her attention. She wouldn't even listen to me. And finally I got her attention. And I reminded her about this parable Jesus told. And I said, I'm just going to put him into Canadian dollars so you can understand. Here's a guy who owes $50,000. And he's got to be thrown into a debtor's jail. He begs the creditor to have mercy on him. And the creditor does. And he says, okay, let's forget about it. You don't owe me anything. And this guy goes out in the street and he sees a guy who owes him five dollars, grabs him by the throat, shakes him till his teeth are out and pay me what you do, I'm going to throw you into a debtor's jail. Now wait a minute. He was forgiven fifty thousand, couldn't forgive five. So I told him about this story. And I said, Now the fifty thousand represents your sins or my sins or your husband's sins against God. That's the sum total of our sins. Because James chapter 2 verse 10 says if you keep the whole law of God and offend in one point, you're guilty of the whole business. You've broken every law that God has given you. Have you ever heard a sermon on that? If you keep the whole law of God and, and offend God in one point only, you have broken every commandment that God ever gave. The reason being the law of God is an indivisible human. It's not ten commandments. It's the commandment of God. That's what it said. So anyway, I said to her, so, the 50,000 is your sins against God, the $5 thing, that's your husband's sin against you. And I said, what did Jesus say to that servant that wouldn't forgive the five? She didn't know. 
And I pointed right at her and I said, you wicked servant. And I stared her down, you know. And finally her head dropped. She looked at her husband and smiled. <laughs> he came running over, fell on his knees, and she ran at him, hands through his hair, and it was all over. I saw him ten years later walking with God, loving each other. Well, she couldn't forgive. You better forgive. You'll be in trouble. You'll be in trouble if you don't. It doesn't hurt the other people, your attitude, but it, it hurts the one who lives within you. He can't settle down and feel at home. Because of this unforgiving spirit we have in the light of Calvary, and I can't forget it. Okay. Then sometimes it's just that we're lazy. I've met lazy Christians. I've met people who told me they were lazy. They just love to sleep all the time, you know? Eat and sleep, and like the dogs over there in Isaiah, you know? They, they like to eat, they like to sleep, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber, it says, you know, they can't bark. They're barkless, you know, but they should be doing their thing, which is barking, but they can't. And the Christian thing is to talk about Jesus, we often won't do that. Maybe we're just too lazy, you know? And some people are like that, just, just plain little lazy. Well, the Bible talks about the slothful over there in Proverbs and other places a number of times, you know. It doesn't speak in complimentary terms of a slothful person either, you know. But uh, there's other thoughts as well. First Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, you know, where we have in the Bible the word therefore or wherefore, it takes you back in the context. He's coming to conclusion from what he's been saying. So 1 Corinthians 15 is a great chapter on the resurrection of Christ and our resurrection when he returns. And then comes this word, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Charles Wesley preached 60,000 times before he died. Whitfield only preached 15,000 times because he died very young. He preaches, he sometimes preached six times in a day, you know. Both those guys did. Spurgeon sometimes preached 18 times in a week. I once preached 28 times in one week. I wouldn't do it again. Four times a day. It was good, but it was too much. Anyway, lazy, too lazy to give out a track, you know. Too lazy to say anything about God. And some of you just, that's the problem, you know. And uh, be steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor is never in vain in the Lord. Years ago, Melford, Saskatchewan, I visited a guy in the hospital. He was a sinner. He was interested in being saved. And I gave him a Bible. Never saw him again. Years rolled by. I was down in the state somewhere. And uh, a guy came up and he said, Do you remember giving a Bible to a guy in Melford, Saskatchewan many years ago? And I said, Yeah, what about him? Well, I said, That guy got saved. He read the Bible, got saved. And he told me that if I ever met you, to let you know what happened. You know? So uh, it may, you don't see it now. You'll see it someday. You may not see it in this life at all. But you'll see it in eternity. What you've done. Tracks you've passed out that people got saved to you never heard about. Or a word you gave. Like, I was in a home one time, and, um, well, the guy, they, he and his wife didn't get along at all, I saw that. They were Christians, but they didn't get along. That's sometimes true of Christians, too. And so I determined to get to talk to this guy somehow, so we ate meals together, but he disappeared as soon as the last crumb was in his mouth. And so this day, I just said to him, um, how was your Christian life? That's exactly what I asked him. How was your Christian life? Fine, he said, he was asleep, ran out of the door, and we saw him again. He just disappeared, you know. I'm back some years later in the same place, holding meetings, and they were not even around, he and his wife, and I thought the worst, you know, and I asked the pastor, where are they? And he roared and left, and he said, you're asking where they are, you know all about it. I said, I, I never heard a thing. You didn't hear anything? He said, no, what happened to them? He said, do you remember asking this guy a question, how was Christian? I said, yeah, I remember that. Well, God used that and broke him. They're both in the ministry. They went to Bible college and in the ministry. It wasn't even Bible voice. Just something I said. And God speaks to us, you know. It doesn't have to be a Bible verse even. It's good if it is, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, lazy. 
And sometimes Christians are crooked. You know, you know sometimes Christians shop, shop for this. Don't tell me they don't. I've got the counsel of some who are doing it, you know. And justifying it. One lady, though, she was honest and she didn't need to steal, but she was in a store and she was trying purses on her arm and walked out of the store with a brand new purse on her arm. She was halfway home before she realized she was still this purse. So she said, if I go back, they'll call me shoplift and I might wind up in jail. So she never went back. But then our meetings guy spoke to her and so she went back. She told her she was going to go back the following day and so we prayed for her and she gave her testimony that night. She was just running over. She told the manager, she asked for the man in the store, she told him what, told him what had happened and, and he said, the lady, you just made my day. He said, I've been here for 30 years. We've never had any shoplifter come back. And you're not even a shoplifter, but you came back. And he said, man, this just made my day, you know. And she said, he was so happy. You know? Yeah, but sometimes Christians do shoplift. And when they come for counseling, they want you to pat them on the head when they need to be kicked in the rear, you know. <laughs> it's stealing no matter how you look at it. It's stealing, you know. It jumped off the shelf. It jumped off the shelf. Now you put your hand up. Didn't you? <laughs> well, people try to justify the cruel things, you know, stupid things. And it's just, you wonder sometimes. Anyway. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather than labor working with his hands a thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needs. Do you ever think of that way? It doesn't say that you may have to shop sock away in the bank, you know. That you may have to give to him that needs. We need to think that too, you know, because as Christians we don't normally think that way. You got uh, several hundred dollars in your pocket, maybe? Maybe there's somebody you're going to meet you need to give some of that money to, you know. Or God may lay a missionary on your heart and you should send them a check, maybe, you know. We should be open that, okay, tithe, that's fine. We should tithe and give off. But there should be times also when we go beyond that. And maybe sometimes even until it hurts a little. But you can't give God. Remember that verse in Ephesians? Whatsoever good thing any man does, the same shall he receive of the law. Do you believe it? You give, you'll get. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom for the same measure that you meet with all, and shall be measured to you again. Maybe that's what the Bible is saying. I'm not preaching a prosperity doctrine, don't misunderstand me. Because Paul said, even unto this present hour, I we both hunger and thirst and naked and buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. So he was not a millionaire. Some of these guys are telling their people, you know. Anyway, the Son of Man has not where lay his head. All right, let him still steal no more. Maybe in the hard part, and we often hear people say, you know, I, I hardened my heart years ago and it's still hard today. The Bible says in the book of Job, who has hardened himself against God and has prospered? Nobody has. In the Gospels, there are, I think, four places where it talks about people having hardened hearts, and three cases were believers. And sometimes we just harden our heart. The preacher gets up, announces text, and right away we freeze. No, no, we don't want them to monkey around that text, you know, because it bugs them. So they just harden their heart, shut off their ears, and uh, maybe sit with a smile on their face. Yeah. George Bell, a good friend of mine, he, a um, great soul man, man. For, he moved to Toronto went from Brandon, Manitoba, and led 400 people to Christ the first years in Toronto. He learned the Latin la Italian language because he was having such a ministry among Italian people. He just learned the Italian la language, you know. But he told a story one time. A fellow in his congregation uh, was falling asleep, you know, all the time. And uh, he tried everything and talked to the guy. And the guy says, Pastor, I don't know what it is. And then you get up to speak, I'm gone. <laughs> so he heard a story. So he talked to this guy's wife and he said, no. He said, get some Limburger cheese, you know, 
And the next time he falls asleep, stick him under his nose, you know. So she did. And he called her and said, Mabel, take your feet off the pillow. <laughs> I mean, just one of those things. Just. Anyway, the guy never slept again. <laughs> yeah. All right. And sometimes Christians lie. You know, in Ephesians chapter 4, where for putting away lying, speak every man truth, he's talking to Christians. You know, lying is a thing that almost everybody gets into sometime, you know. It's easier to tell a lie in some situations than to tell the truth. I down to Saginaw, Michigan, they gave me an old heat. It was, when I was living 10 miles out of the city, and one trip in and out, and I had to put another quart of oil in, you know. And smoke poured out from behind all the time, and they didn't have any insurance on the heat, you know. Anyway, Saginaw, Michigan. And uh, my wife was flying in and, uh, with one of my daughters one night. And so at the last minute, fortunately, the preacher said, take my new car for your wife. Now that old heap you have, take my new car. Okay, so I took his new car, drove about three blocks in the church, and ran a red light. And slammed into another car with his brand new heap, you know. <laughs> hey, Lord, where are you up to? <laughs> So I sit there and the policeman comes and he says, now what's the story? I said, the story is I ran a red light. I didn't see it. It was up here, nothing down here. I didn't see it. And I'm terribly sorry. And he looked at me and he says, well, he said, you know, I've been a cop for 25 years. I think that's the first time I've ever heard the truth. <laughs> well, he said, you know, the court is sitting this afternoon and I can take you down there and get it all settled. So I went down the court. They only charged me $25. It wasn't a bad deal, you know. And the preacher's car had insurance on, so it wasn't a bad deal. But if I had done that with other, uh, other heat, no insurance, you know, I'd still be paying probably, you know. But the Lord had a reason all that because in going to the court session, I had a chance to witness to the cop. And he was wide open. He didn't accept Christ, but he was wide open. And a lot of these people are so open down the road, they get saved, you know. A lot of them do. So, keep that. But speak truth always, no matter how costly it is, you know. Tell them the truth. I got picked up one time by a Mountie. I was driving a 70, 72 Ford Club Wagon, and uh, he said I was speeding. Well, I was watching it pretty good. I didn't think I was speeding. I didn't argue. And so uh, we, we talked a while. And then I had a chance to witness to him. He said, you know, I'm an alcoholic. He said, and if I don't get victory over this alcohol, I won't be a cop very long, you know. They know I'm fighting for it. He said, and I sure need a lot of help. So I told him about Jesus. How Jesus could take care of this problem for him, you know. And uh, he didn't accept the Lord at the moment. But he was listening carefully, and I'm sure down the road he did. And then it dawned on me, this is the reason why the Lord had him, you know, pull me in. God wanted me to talk to this guy. So I really wasn't speeding, but God made him see it differently. I mean, God works with machines too, you know. He's got a lot of ways of working. It should never make you uh, uneasy. It should only make you uneasy if you're living in sin. Then you're up against the mastermind of the universe. And remember in one of the sessions, I think I said, if you travel at the speed of light, which works out to some millions of miles an hour, it'll take you 120,000 years to cross the Milky Way constellation, of which we're a small part, you know. And that's the mind you're up against. So you better not try arguing with God. He's got the last word, always. Full of anger, anger rests in the bosom of fools, it says in Ecclesiastes, you know. Anger rests in the bosom of fools. If you do lose your temper, ask the person or person's forgiveness. Down in Chile, I was speaking at a Bible camp on a lake in the mountains, in the Andes Mountains. It was a beautiful place. About 50 or 60 people, and we had a session one day. We were just sitting in chairs in a big circle in this big room. And a fellow got up and he said, Hey people, he said, 
Do you realize something? They didn't know what he was getting at. He said, one year ago, we were at the same camp, and every one of us that were at the camp a year ago are here today. There isn't one missing. And we got looking around, yeah. That was really strange, you know. They were all there. And he said, if you remember last year, at that session, I lost my temper, and I said some very evil, hard things. And God brought us together today so I could make it right, you know. And he made it right with the group. And I thought to myself, God can even do stuff like that, you know. Get all these people together? Well, look, Christ said, go into the village over against you and you'll find a cold there, you know, being tied. And you just pick it up and if they ask any questions, you say the Lord has need of him. And then also they go and they find exactly as Christ said. He told them again another occasion, when you go into this village, you'll meet a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him and go into the house where he goes in. That's where we're going to have the Passover feast. I mean, God orders all this stuff, you know. He knows how to do it. I had to meet a man in Port of Prairie one time, years ago. I lived there one time. I lived in Winnipeg at the time. This happened, though. But I had to meet this guy, and all I had was his first name. You know, I don't have a great memory, you know, except for the Bible, maybe. But anyway, I said, Lord, I have to meet this guy, so you're going to have to put us together. So I drive an hour and a half, get to Port of Prairie. I'm going down the main drag. And then I saw this post office sign, and I just had a few, I needed to buy some stamps, so I turned him like this, and the guy walked by in front of the car, you know. The guy I'm looking for, so. Yeah, he can do all those things, and we trust him. He can't do anything that we don't trust him, you know. You've got to believe him to see his power and his wisdom. Okay, anger, that's Ecclesiastes 7, 9. Rest in the bosom of fools. Heart full of carnality, Paul said to Christians, Horaces among you, all these envies and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? And sometimes we're doing things in a carnal, that is in a fleshly way, the way the world would do it. Thinking as the world thinks and acting the way they act. And as Christians, we're not supposed to be that kind of person. To be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace, it says in Romans 8. To be spiritual, not so. We should be attempting always to do things in a spiritual way. James spoke about envy and strife and divisions and, and all that. He said, This wisdom doesn't come from above. It's earthly, it's sensual, it's carnal, and it's demonic. It comes from demons. And sometimes we listen to demons, you know, and repeating things the demons are putting into our minds and hearts. And it grieves us that the Christ who lives within. Heart full of idolatry. I read a while ago about an outstanding businessman in Toronto, Canada. He's one of the wealthiest men in Canada. And every morning he spends 15 or 20 minutes on his knees before a wooden idol. He's an idol worshiper. Even in Canada, you know. And people are doing that. We saw it in India. You'd see a temple shaped like a pyramid. On the outside of the temple would be a carved figures. And sometimes will be carved figures of homosexuals engaged in those homosexual acts on the outside of the temples, this kind of thing, you know. But idolatry in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3, it says the covetous man is an idolater. And covetousness is idolatry. Don't ever let money get a hold of your heart. That's not where it's at. I had a preacher friend and any time he was asked a candidate in a church, the first thing he would say to him was this, I don't want to talk about money at any time until we've discovered, you've discovered, and I've discovered it's the will of me to come or not to come. I don't want any money to enter into the problem at all. And he said, you know, sometimes I accepted a call to a church and was getting considerably less than I was getting the church I was in. That didn't mean anything to him. But I know a fellow in Alberta, and uh, he was called to a certain church in another city in Saskatchewan, and he left a note of very often, now, look, I'm earning $42,000 a year where I am, and I can't accept anything less than $42,000 a year if I come here. Now, this was about, oh, 15 years ago. They couldn't afford that, but they wanted him to come because he had a good reputation and all of that. So they, they did call him. Then they struggled for several years trying to meet 
the payments, the bills, and they had a hard time. By contracts. In India, I met a young guy about 25, and he was called to be a pastor, so he was so excited. He said, it's, it's six months down the road before I'm, I'm to become a pastor of this little group. And so, you know, you ask questions like you might ask a pastor here in Canada, now, where will you live? Have they got a house? Oh, no, he said, no. No, we never talked about that, he said, and if they don't have a place, he said, I can sleep under a platform. I've done that before, he said, you know. Oh, really? I knew you wouldn't have a car, so I said, will you have a donkey or a bike or something? No, he said, I'll just walk. I said, and uh, what will they pay you? Oh, he laughed. He said, they're very poor, and they won't, uh, they won't pay me probably anything. And so then I said, and uh, what kind of a library do you have? And he held it up. A little tattered Bible, four by six inches falling apart. That was his library, you know. And he could hardly wait to go. In the light of this other guy, the 42,000 thing, how's that figure this out, you know? See? So my wife and I, we, we bought him some books and we got him a bike and he thought the money would come, you know. He couldn't believe it. But you know, there are people like that. They, they serve God no matter what. And he would see God would provide for him, you know. He didn't have a status sound or a place to play the drama take care of him. He always does, you know. So. Okay, idolatry. A covetous man is an idolatry. And sometimes we just have an unclean heart. We keep thinking evil, you know. Second Corinthians 7 1 says this. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, and remember, there are 7,487 promises in the Bible. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. If you've got an unclean heart, you better get it cleaned up, you know. Draw near to God, heal, draw near to you. What's the next verse say? Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Unclean heart. You know, it says, and this is something North America needs to remember. In the days of Noah, all flesh had corrupted its way. I mean, they were morally corrupt. Everybody was corrupt. It was that bad. Except for Noah and his family. And then, they were violent. There was violence in society everywhere. We've got the same problem today. Violence in society, moral corruptness everywhere. And if God doesn't do something with this generation in North America, He's going to have to apologize to Noah's generation. It goes together. Corrupt minds, no love, violence. One of the universities in eastern, in eastern United States, they were recently given a gift of $80 million to put some of their top brains to find, try and find out what is causing violence in America. I mean, how stupid can they get? Don't they know what's causing it? I mean, you see violence on TV everywhere. Women with pistols, people shooting and stabbing, and they say, oh, no, that doesn't affect anybody. Then why do people spend billions of dollars every year advertising their products if advertising doesn't affect anybody? You know. And then people, they're drunkards and they don't like that word, so they say, well, they're alcoholics and they have a disease. If it's a disease, how come the government licenses places where they can catch it? Right? Does that make any sense to you? It doesn't make any sense to me, you know. But that's how it is. Uncleanness. Witchcraft. I've been amazed. You know, the first time I ever preached or lectured on this problem was in Minneapolis. And uh, about 400 people stayed behind from the first meeting to listen to this, this uh, lecture. At the end, I gave an invitation. How would you shocked? About 40 people came forward, all of the born again believers involved in some form of witchcraft. All the way from one or two things to 30 things, perhaps. And over the years, we've often had to counsel people into witchcraft. And quite often, I would say that mostly it was done sort of innocently in that they didn't even know what they were doing was witchcraft, you know. 
been in, in uh, since we meet Cannon, which is a lot smaller than the Twin Cities in Minneapolis. I lectured on up there, and about 30 people came forward involved in witchcraft, you know. So it's a problem. And so it says in Ephesians 4, don't give any place to the devil. If you give him an inch, he'll take a foot, you know. And you can't just shake it off. You get involved in witchcraft, you can't just shake it off. I don't see a place in the Bible where anybody could do it on their own. They needed outside help. And we've seen that and done that many times over the years. Don't get into that. And things like uh, the Ouija board. I don't know how many people we've dealt with. A friend of mine, a preacher, was in a home and they had a Ouija board sitting on the coffee table. And the coffee table was made of glass uh, sitting on a thing that had rubber. There was no suction cups on it. It was just sitting on rubber. And they had this Ouija board sitting there. And he knew what that was. So he said, uh, they were using it. And he said, can I ask it a question? Sure, they said, go ahead, you know. So he said, you know, have a little heart shaped thing with three legs on it, moves around letters, and spells out words. So he said, Ouija, tell me, who is Jesus Christ? He said, Bill, that thing flew up in the air and turned over and slammed on the floor, broke into a thousand pieces. In it. And the people of the house said, what in the world? He hadn't touched it, you know. Then he explained them what it really was, you know. And so, it's not just a harmless game. Do you want a definition of witchcraft? Listen carefully. Any attempt to get information or help or entertainment by an appeal to hidden sources of spiritual power other than the God of the Bible, that's witchcraft. Any attempt to get information, help, or entertainment from any source other than the God of the Bible, that's witchcraft. They can do all kinds of things. A Christian uh, teacher in Catholic case in Ontario, uh, they had a new principal in the school and he invited all the teachers in the fall uh, to come to his place for a party and they all went and, and he was doing witchcraft. And he had a big candle on the table and he lit this candle and we all just kneel around the table with her hands on the table and she didn't want to do that but because of peer pressure, you know, so she had her hands on the table. And he lit this thing and I said, watch the candle. They watched the candle, and the flame was about this high, and it grew up like this, and about this high. Now he says, watch it again, and it turned down like this, and just like the boat was blowing out here, you know. And she said, well, it's time I got out of here, so she got out of there, you know. But she said, you know what? All the way home walking, there was something walking beside me. She said, you could just sort of see the outline of it. And that night in bed, she had a hard time. There was something in the room, you know. And so, anyway, it says, don't give any place, any room to the devil. Don't do that. It grieves Christ, of course, greatly. We mentioned before something about gossip, bitter ending, strife, and all of that. James 3, 14 to 18, you might want that reference there. Let him that stole steal no more. We talked about that. Not self-willed, it says in Titus 1, 7. I guess this is really, I don't guess, I know, this is the basis of all our problems in the area of sin. You know, we're self-willed. We want to do what we want to do whether God wants it or not, you know. And sometimes we say, well, God, I'll do it this once, I'll never do it again. Why do it even this once, you know? That's not right either, you know. So, it grieves God's Spirit. That list he gives over there in Ephesians, you know, Ephesians 4, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Then in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, Quench not the Spirit. The word quench has the idea of throwing water on a fire. And if we quench the Spirit when He leaves us to do something, we're putting water on the fire. And that quench that puts the Spirit down, it grieves Him. Um, I think one thing that most of us at some time entertain is just fear. The fear of man brings a snare. Who told that? Many examples in the Bible, including Abraham. He lied on two different occasions. Then his son Isaac lied too far on his dad's bad example. And for the same reason, because telling the truth was too unpleasant, they were among unconverted people and they might have been killed, they figured, and they forgot that God was a God of the universe, not just a tribal deity. 
Sometimes we forget that too, you know. God is everywhere. If you're among people and somebody blasphemes God or Christ, do you ever say anything? Do you? <laughs> Most of us don't. I mean, it hurts us, we don't like to hear that, and we walk away. Listen, that's an open door for a witness, you know. I found that out years ago. Just say something. Say something, you know. I was walking with a brother-in-law of mine who at that time was not a Christian. He and his wife and I were walking down the street. I guess it was here in Winnipeg. And a couple of guys passed us and they were blaspheming God. And my unsaved brother-in-law turned, went back, stopped these guys and bawled them out for cursing. He wasn't even a Christian. He had some moral standards. But it's an opportunity, you know. I'm going past the drugstore and there's probably 15 or 20 kids standing in a big circle there having a great time. And one of these kids, he started shooting out his big mouth, you know, about Christ. And they were laughing, giggling, and so I broke through the group and walked up to him. And I said, uh, you were talking about my best friend, Jesus Christ, and I don't like the way you talked about him. And you know, he never said a word, he just stared at me with his mouth open. He couldn't talk, you know. And I waited, nobody in the group said a word, so I very turned and walked out of the group when I'm down the street. We'll never forget that, you know, see. But we have opportunities like that. And even if it's a rough crowd, you say something, you know what you'll find? Mostly they'll, they'll quite, I've never had a bad reaction in a case like that. You'd expect it in some cases, and you don't, you don't really see that because God is with you in that. I sometimes tell people, you know, I remember one time, this guy, I didn't know he was a bull of the woods back in the Shantyman days, and he had a terrible reputation, I found a little later on. He was blaspheming all the time. We have to meet in the woods, you know, in the bush. And so uh, he got cursing, and he said, you know, his life in the bush, he said, it's terrible. He said, trucks break down, and he gets to be 40 below at night, and nothing works in the morning. Blasphemes some more, and I said, I'm surprised it isn't even worse. He said, why did you say that? Well, I said, I hear you guys all the time asking God to damn this truck and damn this and damn that and damn something else. And you know, God answers prayer. <laughs> oh, well, he said, well, now, wait a minute. He said, we don't mean it. I said, why don't you tell God that so he'll understand? <laughs> we don't mean it. After I found who he was, and man, I was really taking a bull by the horns. I didn't realize he had this awful reputation of being this big blasphemer, you know, but he just backed off, you know. People never get challenged, you know. And they need to be challenged, and we can do it. Do it in a nice way, you know. Just let them know you're there, and Christ is alive. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. First John chapter 4, you know. He that fears is not made perfect in love. And God's love is the only love that is perfect. Remember faith works by love? Remember that? Galatians chapter 5 verse 8 I think. Perfect love casts out fear. One time, within a week, one week period, two different gals, not the same, in the same meeting or anything, they came for counseling, and they were both filled with fear after listening to some rock music, you know. And uh, they said, we can't get this stuff out of our mind, you know. I know today they're using a lot of Christian rock. Do you know where the, word, the term rock and roll came from? That describes sex on the streets in Harlem in New York. That's where it started. And so they're talking about Christian rock? That bugs me, you know. That's not, not right, I don't think, you know. I wonder sometimes what we're thinking about in some of these areas in our churches, you know. Doesn't it say, be still and know that I'm God? Doesn't it say, the Lord is in his holy temple and all the earth keeps silence before him? But you get into some meetings and the noise is so loud, you have to put pumps in your ears, you know. Someone said, Spurgeon said, nonsense is not improved by being dull. You believe?
believe that? Am I trampling on some toes today? I don't know. I don't really care. Yeah, nonsense what? Nonsense is not improved by being bellowed. Holler. No, that's, that's true. We need to have times where it's quiet and you can think. People walking around carrying the radio with them, listening to music all day long, you know. That is not healthy, I don't think. It's not good. You know. God can't even talk to them because they don't have any time for Him. Okay, we're talking about fear and the double mindedness last of all. James 4 8. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. So, double mindedness is due to impurity of heart. James 1 8 talks about that. A double minded man is unstable in all his ways. And the tribe of Reuben, God said, Reuben, unstable is water, thou shalt not excel. And sometimes we belong to the tribe of Reuben, you know, we're very unstable. Like water is moved by wind very easily, and we're like that sometimes as Christian believers. We don't have a stable position. It depends on the people we're with at the time. We stand here, if they're Christians, we stand somewhere else. If they're backslide, we stand somewhere else again, if they're sinners. You think that pleases God? No, be steadfast. Remember, unmovable. That's what it said. For you and for me. And remember, Christ lives in your heart. And Paul was praying you might settle down and feel at home. Really at home. In our hearts. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Sometimes there's a lot of bitterness even in Christian homes. And sometimes we need to. You know, Gordon Bailey, so mightily used of God. I asked him one time, I said, Gordon, you have any trouble getting sermons? Because he wasn't a student. But when I died, I gave him the New Testament on tapes. And since he was a cattle inspector at the time, he was traveling all the time here and there, you know. So he and finally got to the place where he really knew the New Testament, you know. He said, I don't have any trouble getting sermons. But he said, I have trouble in another area. So what is it? I said, he said, well, have an argument with my wife, and I go on the road to preach, nothing ever happens, you know. I got a phone call, asked my wife's forgiveness. And he said, but Bill, I got a question, you know. When it comes to some disagreement, he says, how come the wife is always right? <laughs> well, I said, well, you've learned something a lot of husbands haven't learned yet. <laughs> they're wives, you know. And they're part of you. You become one flesh. You remember, um, Husbands, you should dwell with your wives according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And brethren, if, you're, if your relation with your wife isn't right, your prayer life will be crippled. You can guarantee it. Be absolutely right. They don't go, you know, by facts. They go by feelings more and by influences and stuff and ideas. And us, you know, they like to talk and the men like to say some things, right? <laughs> At least they tell me that's how it is. <laughs> We have to know that giving honor unto the wife is not doing your best. I was in a home one time in Kalarna, Manitoba. And he was 85 and she was 65. And they were in love like a couple of teenagers. I know something like him. He'd walk by and pinch her. And she'd look at him and glare at him. And then she'd smile. And then she'd go and pinch him, you know. <laughs> Every time they walked past each other, they had to touch each other with their elbow, their hand or something. And then they'd roar with laughter, you know. This was going on all day long. It was in their home, you know. Then one day, he'd gone out to do something. I didn't know he was putting storm windows on for the winter anymore. At his age, on a ladder. So I'm helping her with the dishes in the kitchen, you know, and all of a sudden the ladder goes back past the window, and he's hanging on to the right. <laughs> and we were tearing outside, and it caught on the eve, and there he's hanging at an angle, you know. He looks at his wife and he starts to laugh. She starts to laugh, you know. And we roared with laughter, all of us. And finally, some neighbors came and got him down over there, you know. <laughs> Then I heard she died. And I was in Kalani not after an anniversary service not long after she passed away. And I said, Brother Gil, I said, how is it with you? And he said, I miss my beloved. I miss her terribly. I'm sure he did. Well, he's an man. I mean, I'm sure that when he got the most money shouting time, you know, man. Oh, I don't think they have reruns, but if they have, I'd like to see some of these. 
It's such a great thing to see, though. At that, at that age, and she had a physical deformity, and yet he loved her with all his heart. We don't see a lot of it today. Double mindless purify your hearts, okay. Did you know the Bible teaches clearly both in the Old Testament and the New Testament that Jesus Christ has circumcised our heart? Now the Bible speaks about circumcision in the flesh for the Israelites, the, the Jewish people. I was talking to a Jew one time, he said, do you understand that the Old Testament speaks about circumcision of the heart? And he looked at me and said, yes, I know that. He knew that. He didn't know what it meant, you know. But in Romans chapter 2, we're told that he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision that which is outward in the heart. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not a member of God. And so there is such a thing as circumcision of the heart. And if you turn to Colossians chapter 2, there's a verse there we maybe should look at as we close. Colossians chapter 2. Verse 11. In whom, he's talking about Christ, in whom also you are circumcised, but the circumcision made without hands, it's not a human thing, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. If there's anything in your life that needs to go, ask Christ to do it. To circumcise that, take it out of your life. He'll do that for you. That Christ may settle down and feel home in your hearts by faith. And so if there's a problem there in your life, maybe something I thought there was something I haven't even mentioned or God was mentioning, people take care of it. Try and stay, you know the Bible says walk in love. Walk in love. Let all your things be done with love. Walk in love. Live in love. And have a loving attitude to everybody that you meet. I had a man in one of my churches and he, I guess he was probably the most faithful witness next to Bill Rempel, or maybe his same as Bill Rempel, but anybody I ever met, you know. He just loved to witness. But you know what he told me? He said, for many years I wanted to be a Christian and I didn't know how. And he had some close relatives who lived near his place who never once shared the gospel with him. So he never found out how to be a Christian. He's in his 50s. He says, I've heard people talking about God and religion. Got as close as I could and listened to everything I heard, you know, hoping to get some light on it. He didn't read the Bible. He didn't know about that. But this went on and on, you know. Then one day, a young Christian who was a, a druggist, whose wife was a doctor, they were going as a team to Africa as missionaries and did go. And uh, he said to this man, Elmer, Jesus Christ means everything in the world to me. What does he mean to you? And he said, boy, I was getting mad. That young whippersnapper talking to me that way. Man, he was mad, you know. But within 24 hours, he was saved, you know. And he had such a sweet way. If you introduced him to somebody, within three seconds, he'd be talking to him about Jesus, you know. And he had such a sweet way. Nobody could mad, get mad at him, you know. He says, and sometimes he told us, Pastor, I've been duck hunting, and I've wounded a couple of ducks, and I can't get them in the boat. Could you come and help me? Well, I knew what he meant. He'd been talking to some sinners, and he got them so far, he couldn't get them all the way. He wanted me to come and help him get in the boat, you know. Oh, he was, he was a great, great person. Look the Lord now. Actually, when he was 80 years of age, he contracted incurable cancer. He asked him both to pray for him, and he was healed, and he lived for some years after that. Now he's in heaven. Now he's in heaven. And someday we'll be there, all of us. You know. Take heed how you build on Christ the foundation. Remember we're told that? Take heed how you build thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Build with gold and silver and precious stones, not with wood and stubble, we're told. Remember? Let's pray.